Revelation chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we will have the scripture that I'm going to be referring to on the screens, but uh, it's always good if you bring your Bible. We are starting a brand new series of messages today uh, called The Seven Churches of Revelation. Every week for the next six weeks after this, we will be talking about a different church that Jesus addresses. He addresses some of the issues that they face as believers, some of the deficiencies they have, as well as some of the strengths. And um, I think that these, these uh, words to these churches written in the book of Revelation can still be effective and applicable to you and me today as individual believers and to us corporately as a part of the body of Christ. So it's been my prayer that the Lord would really use this series to speak to all of us, self-included. And today we're talking, uh, we're going to address the church at Ephesus, but right before we do, I would, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you, especially those of you that are visiting. And uh, if you're looking for a church home, you really, uh, I, I hope that you seriously consider what the Lord's doing here. I don't know if the rest of you have recently been in a position where you needed to find a church to call home. But um, my heart goes out to those that are. It's not fun, it's not easy, it's difficult, and at times I believe it can even be discouraging. I mean, when you stop and think about what you're looking for, when you're looking for a local church to attend, to minister in, to worship with others in, how do you examine that church? How do you evaluate that church and its ministries? I mean, honestly, some churches can have incredible facilities, but inside they might house a dying or even a dead congregation. I mean, it's possible. Uh, They may have terrible facilities, on the other hand, and have a very vibrant congregation making kingdom impact. I mean, how do you you examine, how do you evaluate a church and its ministries? Sometimes even the scripture says that uh, the church that we think is rich might be very poor in God's eyes. And the church that we assume is poor Uh, might actually turn out to be rich in spiritual things. So again, um, how do you examine and evaluate a local church since we're talking about local churches today in the book of Revelation? Here's what I've come to, uh, to know about churches. There is no perfect church. Not today, Uh, probably not ever. There's no perfect church. All of us uh, who compose the local church, we have our own backgrounds, our own baggage, our own likes and dislikes. And and, you know, none of us are perfect. We, We don't ever really achieve that spot. And here's the other thing that I know. Only Jesus can really accurately determine a church's true condition. I mean, only Jesus can do that. He's the one who sees what's happening inside and out, spiritually and physically, as well as the ministries and the motives behind them. Only only Jesus can really determine a church's true condition. And the reason that he can do that is because the scripture says he's the head of the church. He's the one who created the church as a vehicle to expand his kingdom and to share the good news with a lost and dying world. He's the one who calls leaders. He's the one who opens and closes doors. It's his church. And we dare not ever forget that. It's his church. And here's the other thing I know from scripture. He wants to build his church. He doesn't want it to be stagnant. He doesn't want it to be uh, self-destructive. He doesn't want it to wound people. I mean, he wants to expand the kingdom. He wants us to fulfill the Great Commission and make a difference in the world in which he's placed us. Now, as we consider all that, we have to keep in mind that the Scripture teaches us the local church is a gathering of believers. It's not a building. I mean, it's a gathering of people who have been called by Jesus to follow him. They've answered the call. They've said, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. They're a group of people who are in the process of being changed by him. That's why it's really a hospital uh, more than a place of perfection. I mean, we're being changed, all of us. We all have a next step. We all have something that the Lord's working on in our life. And it's also a group of people who have, however, been commissioned by Jesus to reach others and impact the world. So as we begin this new series today, as we see what Jesus says to seven specific churches in the book of Revelation, these churches, just like ours, are are representative of a group of believers located in specific cities in the New Testament world. These are churches that actually existed. They'd been called. They, just like us, were being changed by Christ. They'd been commissioned by him. 
And this letter that we call Revelation is, is really, according to itself, intended to be passed around and read in all the churches. This is a difficult book for many of us as believers because it, it is filled with prophecy. It is filled with symbolism. But it was a book that was intended to be read by all the churches. It gave them instructions on how they were to live, what they were to expect as they revealed future events to them. It, it, was, it literally contains words of warning, which we're going to see in part today. But it's also meant to be encouraging to believers. And it's filled with, as I said, symbolism that sometimes makes it difficult for us to understand. Here's the thing that we have to keep in mind. The book of Revelation, as we dive into it, speaks to both groups of believers, churches, but it also speaks to individuals. Because it's individuals like you and me that make up the local church. The church is made up of individuals. It's individuals who determine the spiritual life of a local church. So, while we study what's being said to these individual churches, it's entirely appropriate, as a matter of fact, I would say even necessary, to apply what's being said to these local churches to ourselves personally. And so we're going to tear apart one particular church today, and then we're going to make some application in terms of what it would mean to us if, if we really were listening to perhaps what the Spirit might want to say to us. So... In terms of introduction, here's what you need to know as we begin. The writer of this book is the disciple John. He's one of the original 12 disciples. He's now, at this stage of his life, he's been exiled to an island called Patmos. And the year that he receives this vision and writes these words down, as he's instructed, is about 95 A.D., now, if you're, if you're into history, and if you can sort of create a timeline in your mind, this is some 30 years after all the other disciples have passed away. John is the one that's left. He's the last remaining uh, disciple of the original 12. He's exiled on this island. It's approximately the year 95 AD, and he's given this vision of Jesus. And in this vision, he's given a message for the believers in these seven churches. And what Jesus is going to say, he's going to speak of what's currently happening in these churches, but he's also going to speak of what the future holds for them. And the first message is literally given to this church in Ephesus. Now here's what you need to know about Ephesus, just by way of background. Ephesus is a major city of this period of time. It's about 60 miles away from where John is at on the island of Patmos. And for all practical purposes, this city is the commercial capital of Asia, Asia Minor, as what we would refer to it today, in an area that we call Turkey. It's a seaport city, and it's a big city. It's not a little city. Uh, estimates are that the population of Ephesus at this time of the writing was about 300,000 people. This is a big city, it's a sprawling city, and it's a wealthy city. The reason they're wealthy is because of all the commerce that's pouring into the city. And inside of this particular city is one other interesting thing. This city had within it one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a magnificent temple that the Greeks built to Artemis. Artemis was a deity in the Greek culture. The Romans renamed her Diana. So this was an important cultural site. It was a, a place of commerce. This is a big city. Now, one other thing you need to know before we jump into this. Paul had visited this city about 43 years earlier than what John is writing right now. About 43 years earlier, Paul went to the city of Ephesus and established a brand new church. As a matter of fact, the book of Acts tells us he worked there for three years. And this early ministry in the, in the city of Ephesus, it was incredible. Acts chapter 19 actually records for us, verse 10, that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God because it was proclaimed in Ephesus. Paul later wrote to this church uh, what we call the book of Ephesians, uh, the letter to the, the believers at Ephesus. And so this church is an important church. It was a vital church. It was a healthy church when Paul uh, started it. Now, to put 
this part of Revelation into proper context, we just have to understand the church is 40 years old now. It's 40 years. It's been in existence for 40 plus years. Many things have now changed. A lot of ministry has happened. A lot of good and great things have happened. But there are things that have slowly changed within this community of believers. And that's the group that Jesus addresses here in Revelation. And John records it. Let's pick this up and see what Jesus has to say to this church. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, please understand, before we go further, the angel of the church of Ephesus, the word angel uh, in the Greek language is, is commonly used as messenger. In this case, it's probably symbolic of, of the pastor, the leader of this particular congregation. All right? This is what Jesus says to them. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now, those are incredible words. And we're going to look at that a little bit deeper in a moment. But listen to what comes next. Jesus is speaking. And he says, yet, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, let, let me just pause right there. You know, this Nicolaitan comment. Today, the Nicolaitan group, the, the group that's referred to here, we really don't know very much at all about them. I mean, you go to a Bible commentary and they're going to say, yeah, nobody knows the Nicolaitans. This was a subgroup. This was a group that was around Ephesus at the time. They may have been a group that were compromising uh, some of their beliefs by allowing some pagan religious practices into the church. We're not sure. Maybe they were trying to avoid persecution and social tensions that other believers were experiencing. We just don't know a lot about the Nicolaitans. But please recognize the scripture says you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. You know, the church, they're, they're not being condemned for hating the Nicolaitans. They hated the practice. Whatever it was they were doing, the Lord says that he also hated that. So this is the way it finishes up. Whoever has ears, verse 7, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, with, with that read as a backdrop, Let's just go back and quickly tear apart this section of Scripture and look at the characteristics of the church at Ephesus. And in a little while, we're going to compare ourselves. We may do that as we move through it. But I, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us from what's being said here to this church in Ephesus. So what's their characteristics? Number one, they were workers. They were commended for being workers. Jesus says, I know your deeds. Your hard work. In other words, the people in the church at Ephesus at this time, they were active. They weren't coasting. They weren't relaxing uh, on their previous laurel, so to speak. They had lots of things going on. But as we're about to see, Jesus is not only concerned with what we do, but with who we are in relationship to him. Now, this is something Jesus has said before. I mean, in Matthew chapter 7, when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he said to everybody, listen, there's coming a day when people are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? In other words, Lord, there was a day, you know, we, we, we ministered, we had all this stuff going on, and yet Jesus said, he's going to say to them, I never knew you. I was never in relationship with you. You were doing all these things. You were busy. And that's a theme that's going to come up over and over here. You were busy, 
but I never knew you. You, you left your first love. You know, today, I, I just want to say this. I think it's easy to get caught up in this same concept. It, it's easy to get, be caught up in what we do while we allow our relationship to sort of deteriorate. You know, I, I'm, I'm seeing this more and more. Uh, I'm, I'm talking with lots of people that are nearing retirement age, and it seems to be a theme that keeps coming back over and over. You know, we, we, we tend to establish our identities by what we do. You know, a police officer, before he retires, I can almost guarantee you one of the things he's going to miss deeply is, man, people don't look at me as a police officer anymore. I think pastors are probably the same way. You know, someday when I get to retire, if the Lord allows, I'm going to look back and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not the pastor at St. Mark anymore. Who am I? It's at that point that I need to recognize that it's much more than what I do, it's who I am in relationship to God the Father. And that's what Jesus is trying to drive home here. We're not basing uh, our effectiveness or who we are on what we do. It's got to be coupled with who we are. Now this group, they were workers. But the Bible also tells us, secondly, they were well taught. They, they understood the scriptures. The, the Bible says, Jesus said that, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles and are not. You found them to be false. Now, if you go back and do a little bit of history in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul leaves this church, okay, after serving there for three years, he leaves this church. The, the parting words that he gives to the leadership is, be shepherds of the church. Be on your guard for men who will distort the truth. He knew what was going to happen, and he encouraged the leaders of this church. He said, listen, Teach yourselves well. Teach others well. Because people will come in who will try to distort the truth of the gospel. And now here in Revelation, 40 years later, we see that they still have correct doctrine. I mean, they're very concerned about correct teaching. They were right in protecting the church from false teachers. They stood for what was right. And yet Jesus has something negative to say about their relationship and their love. Now, here's the deal. I believe that this characteristic for standing for truth, when it's not balanced with compassion, which Jesus addresses here, it begins to come across as something that we really don't like to, to think of, but it, it comes across as being judgmental and harsh to other people that, that we speak the truth to, so to speak. A long time ago, I was, I was given sort of a formula. I wrote it down. I've never forgotten this. Somebody once said that compassion without truth leads to heresy or, or a license to sin. You know, if you're real compassionate but you don't stand on the truth, man, you're going to be off in the weeds someplace that you don't belong. But the opposite is true. Truth, when it's proclaimed without compassion, simply comes across as harshness and ultimately leads to a legalistic sort of attitude. It's, it's the pendulum clear uh, swung the other direction. That's why it's so important to balance truth and compassion. And I think Jesus is alluding to that here. He's saying, man, you guys, you're well taught. But there's something lacking. You know, in our own congregation... <clears throat> I, I just want to say that I think there are some people who are doing an incredible job with this, of balancing truth and compassion. And, you, you know, for those of you that might be visiting with us, our denomination, we're a small denomination, um, we do not believe in abortion. We think that abortion is wrong. And, and, and honestly, we stand for truth on that matter. But sometimes, I'm going to be honest and, and, and revealing as well, I think some within the denomination, we, we perhaps we don't understand that the compassionate side of that also has to be included in our stand on truthfulness. I mean, how, how are we helping the mother that finds herself in a really difficult place and is, is fighting the temptation to go through with an abortion? I, I'm so appreciative of a large group of people in our own congregation here. And I'm going to give you a shout out today. There's a large group of you who have said, in essence, yeah, we stand on truth, but I tell you what, we're willing to say yes to foster care. We're willing to say yes to adoption. We're willing to say yes, we want to support mothers that are in a difficult spot. 
That's the balancing between truth and compassion. And as the pastor of this church, I just want to remind you and tell you again, we appreciate that about you. And we want to stand with you whenever possible to assist as you stand for truth and compassion at the same time. Well, this church... This church in Ephesus, they were workers, they were well taught, they stood for the truth, they were a little lacking in the compassion apparently, we'll get to that. Thirdly, they weathered storms. Jesus says, you've persevered, you've endured hardships for my name, and you haven't grown weary. You know, the church at Ephesus, they faced trials, they encountered problems, they suffered very painful events in their midst, they endured hard times, and the crazy thing is, they weren't weary, they persevered, they never came to a point when they said, hey, let's let somebody else do it, they never came to a point when they said, I'm done, I can't go any further, no, they hung in there, they persevered. All of this sort of reminds me of, of the way our congregation has developed through the years. I mean, I, I would like to think that, you know, there, there are so many workers with a servant spirit here at St. Mark. We, we certainly, I would hope that many of us are taking our next step and learning more about how, how Scripture works and how compassion goes along with it. And I think we as a congregation, we've weathered storms in the past. And I pray, I pray as we move on in the, book of, uh, in the book of Revelation, as we look at Ephesians, that we don't lose our first love. Because here comes the next part that we see about this characteristic of the church at Ephesus. They were warned. Jesus steps in the midst of all those good things, and he says, listen. He says, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Now, the word forsaken here means you've stopped doing something. You've given something up. You've, you've neglected something. You've quit something. And the phrase, the love you had at first, is a comparative phrase. It, it's comparing the love they had at first with their love now. Now, here, here's what I, I discovered. There's been lots of theories as to, as to what this meant. What in the world is Jesus talking about here? Is he talking about their love for him? Maybe. Is he talking about their love for one another? Well, that's a possibility. Is he talking about love for the lost? That could be. Is he talking about a loveless church that just has cold orthodoxy, in other words, right doctrine? It's a possibility. But we can only assume by what is said that some of the original passion that was present at best had turned into feelings of duty that the ministry had become a machine, perhaps. At worst, perhaps it had turned into feelings of disgust. We don't know. All we can assume is that some of the original passion that these believers had is no longer present. It's not first. Now, I ask myself as I'm studying this, how in the world do you lose your first love? I mean, how, is that sort of like losing your keys you just can't find it? Is it like losing the remote control? Is it that they misplace something? And, and the reality is it's not that. The truth is more along the lines that something has replaced their first love. Something has taken its place. In the, in the Ephesians case, love, I believe, was replaced by busyness. It was replaced by maybe a sense of duty. It was replaced by, by this sense of, I have a responsibility. I need to work. I need to do what I'm called to do. And so here, for me, this is, this is the lesson here. We must never forget the great commandment as we're fulfilling the great commission. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That fits like a glove into the great commission of go therefore into all the world, spreading the gospel, baptizing people. They cannot exist without one another. The warning for the church at Ephesus included this statement, if you don't repent, if you don't stop doing this, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Here's what I notice about that. The church that loses its love will soon lose its light. The same is true of you and me. 
when we lose our passion for Jesus Christ, I can almost guarantee you, we're going to lose our effectiveness, the light that we're supposed to be in a dark world. When Jesus says, if you don't repent, I will come to you, it's not a reference to the second coming. It's him saying, listen, I will come to you, but I'm coming to you in judgment. I will remove your lampstand. I will take away your opportunity. They were warned. And finally, they were shown the way back. Not only does he say you need to repent, but he, he tells them how in verse 5. He says, consider how far you've fallen. You know what that is? It's remembering. In essence, Jesus is saying, listen, church at Ephesus, stop. Remember where you were before in your passion, in your love. And secondly, repent. Repent is a simple little word that means stop heading the direction you're heading now and turn around and go the other way. And finally, the the final thing is just to repeat. Do the things you did at first. Remember, repent, redo or repeat, whatever word you want to use. That's the formula, quite frankly, for the way back for any believer who's gotten off track with the Lord. Stop, remember, repent. Go back to that place where you lost your way. And notice what the promise is. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, in my studies and preparation for this, I I learned something new. Um, This is somewhat of a play on words that the Ephesians would have understood better than we do. And the reason they would understand it is because a tree image apparently was associated with the goddess Artemis in this temple that was in the middle of of Ephesus. A tree image was associated with with her worship, etc. And for the Ephesians, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, this right to eat from the true tree of life It's vindication for your willingness to stand strong in the truth and to compassionately live out your faith. And it stands in contrast, is what he's really communicating here, to the false promises of everybody that that gave their allegiance to the temple of Artemis. Empty promises that meant nothing. Jesus is saying, listen, to the one who is victorious... I'm going to give you the right to eat from the tree of life. And do you know where it's at? It's in the paradise of God. So with all of that said, I mean, the million-dollar question for me is, how in the world can we not fall into the trap of losing our first love? How can we, even though we want to be strong and follow Christ closely, how can we be certain to keep first things first? What can we apply from truth that's contained in this Scripture? I mean, number one, I think it's simply to listen to Jesus. We've got to make this a priority, listening to him. In in Revelation 1-3, John begins his, his whole section by saying, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, that's listening, and take it to heart. All right? Developing an ear to hear Jesus is critical For you and me to keep first things first. Developing the the ability to discern his voice, to identify his voice, and then follow the instructions that he gives us is vital for you and me to stay on course spiritually. I mean, the Old Testament says this stuff over and over, as well as the New. In the Old Testament, you know, Israel was told over and over, listen and be careful to do what the Lord says. I even think in the New Testament, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, remember when a couple of the disciples were there with Jesus and and God the Father speaks and he says, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased, we forget the next phrase that says, listen to him, listen to him. How do you listen to Jesus? Well, quite frankly, friends, at times it, it takes us slowing down. It, it causes us the need to push the pause button and the busyness of our life. It requires some solitude at times. It requires a place where you can reflect. It requires a time when you can pray and then listen. 
to what he might want to say to you. It, it requires a time of, of spending it in God's word and not just reading it to understand it, but also then inviting the spirit to use those words to speak truth into your life. It's the application. We need to certainly learn to listen to Jesus. But how else can we keep first things first? I mean, secondly, I think we need to refuse to hide behind busyness. We've got to stop this. Chuck Swindoll, a lot of you uh, perhaps enjoyed at one point reading all the new books that Chuck Swindoll would put out. I used to buy every one of them, and I'd get my hands on and read it, kept it in my library for years. Chuck Swindoll wrote a little section on busyness that I absolutely adore. And this is what he says. It's uh, on the screen. Busyness substitutes shallow frenzy for deeper friendships. Busyness feeds the ego but starves the inner man. Busyness fills a calendar but it fractures a family. Busyness cultivates a program that plows under priorities. I think that's what Jesus is trying to communicate to the church at Ephesus. I think that's what he's trying to communicate to us. We've got to stop hiding behind our busyness. I mean, Jesus does commend this church for working hard, for persevering, for resisting sin, for examining the claims of false prophets, and even enduring hardships without becoming weary. But all of these wonderful characteristics in and of themselves should have been coming from a position of deep love for the Lord. And it wasn't. I just want to say busyness is not a substitute for intimacy with Jesus. Busyness is not a substitute for intimacy with Jesus. Labor is not a substitute for love. Purity is not a substitute for passion. So we need to understand, refuse. We need to refuse to hide behind our busyness. We need to push the pause button. Thirdly, we need to keep our spiritual relationship fresh. Now, some of you might think, okay, Pastor John, what are you talking about here? How do we do that? I can just use an illustration that I hope proves the point. This past week, uh, my wife and I, we got to spend a couple of nights out at uh, Potato Creek camping. I drove back in for work every day, but it was an enjoyable time. The weather was awesome. We had a campfire every single night. And you know what I thought as I was sitting around that campfire? I recognized that that fire left alone of its own would eventually go out. It literally required tending on my part. I had to take a poker and pull the, the logs up close to one another. I had to put a couple of new logs on if we wanted to extend the life of that fire. And I got to thinking, that's exactly what I'm trying to communicate about keeping our spiritual relationship fresh. We, we can't have this, this wonderful experience of flame and fire and light piercing darkness and then just expect it to go on forever and ever without ever tending it. Keep your spiritual relationship fresh. And finally, renew your relationship if needed. This whole deal of remembering and repenting and then repeating is essential. You want to keep first things first? You want your love to remain strong and passionate and hot for Jesus Christ, for his call in your life, for a lost and dying world? Then we need to remember. We need to perhaps repent. And we need to repeat what we've done before. In closing, I just want to ask you a couple of quick questions and then we're going to sing. Is Jesus Christ really the first priority of your life? I mean, I have to ask that. Is there a possibility that busyness has overcome intimacy in your spiritual life? Is there a possibility that what you once did out of passion is now looked at more in your life as a duty, as a responsibility? Has ministry become a machine? 
And finally, is your spiritual relationship suffering because of your neglect? Has your fire gone out? I want to encourage you, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you today, remember, remember what it was like at one time. And repent. Say, Lord, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep going this direction. Something's gotta happen. Go back to the place where you lost that passion. I believe you'll find Jesus there. Trust him. Don't be afraid. He's got a wonderful plan for you. I want to pray for you before we sing. Would you stand with me?